It's a real honor for me to come up here and, and speak to you and, and continue on in this sermon series about Joseph, um, son of Jacob. It's one of my very favorite parts of the Bible. Each year I either read a, uh, well, I read the Bible every year. And whether it's a, uh, I can't think of the term, whether it's a, uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the type that puts things like you, b- b- chrono- chronological, thank you. So whether it's a chronological or just your ordinary ESV or whatever version, you know, it's about February when I hit this story. Uh, and I, I used that word story, and I hated it that I just said it. Because let me tell you, uh, when I was a, a rookie in the Payne Weber bullpen, I had I'd done my, te- uh, my tests, my Series 7, 66 insurance. I had passed all those things. And so we were working on these things called deliverables before I went up to, up to the Northeast for three wonderful weeks. But um, I was reading my Bible one day in, in lunch, and we were in cubicles in the bullpen, and this, this younger guy, he said, what are you reading? I said, well, I'm reading my Bible. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, it, it's, you know, it's how I, I hone my theology, how I get to know God better, how I learn. He said, well, I said, do you ever read the Bible? He said, no. He said, it's just a bunch of old stories, and I don't even think most of them are true. And so and I never forgot that. You know, I just thought, because a story starts out with once upon a time, you know. And so I don't want to call this a story. I want to call it a a narrative or the history of Joseph. So um, would you pray with me? Precious Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth and, and the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord God, we're so grateful that we can come into your presence and sing praises and that we can, we can lift our voices to you, Lord, and that we can study your word openly. And I pray that that would always be the case in this country, Father. And I just pray that, uh, that you would grow your church and that your spirit would move mightily and, and would cause uh, hearts to stir in millions, Father. And uh, Lord God, put me, put me a mile behind the cross today, Father, and just let this be all about you and your glory. And uh, I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So looking back a little bit, let's, let's think about, and this goes back beyond before the, the story of, uh, of Joseph, and I said it again. Um, Jacob was the twin brother of Esau. And if you remember, Jacob wrestles with God and, and God touches his hip socket during their confrontation and puts his hip out of, out of place. And, and he also named, gave Jacob an additional name, Israel. And so we see this in Genesis 32 and 35. Um, later on in Jacob's life, he's going out to greet Esau and he is taking his whole family and he's got a procession and in front of him he's sending droves of animals as gifts to Esau because he quite frankly is anxious he doesn't know how Esau's going to react um, you know and because if you remember uh, Jacob kind of finagled the birthright away from Esau and so for good reason he has a little trepidation now in this procession you've got the servants first and then you've got the family but, but Jacob, for some reason, had Rachel, one of his wives, and Joseph put in the rear of the group for their safety in, in case of violence. And so the servants went first, the family, and then way in the back you have, have Rachel and, and Joseph. And so it, it's just curious to me that in this, in this passage in 33.3 that Joseph is the only son of all his sons mentioned. And, and by the way, when this is all done, Esau was thrilled to see him. So that story... Uh, had a happy ending. I I think it's important to note also that Jacob uh, is the grandson of Abraham, and and that makes Joseph the great-grandson of Abraham. So Joseph comes from a family that has been shown much favor by God and is used mightily by God. In chapter 37, Joseph is pastoring the flock with his brothers, and we're told that that Jacob loved Joseph uh, because he was a son of his old age. And, you know, when I think about my children, I'm a father of three and a grandfather of four, and I mentioned the Payne Weber thing. Well, that's been 22 years ago, and around that time, you know, I was, man, I had left a job, and my, my income got cut by two-thirds, and we have three kids in a house, and I'm trying to provide for my family, and I'm running, and i am still got the farm, and I'm trying to, I was really doing two full-time jobs for a time, but, um, but God is, is wonderful, and he he, he really blessed us during that time. But the kids, they grow up so fast. And I, I was looking at Corey this morning. I don't know where you're sitting, Corey. But how long has it been since you graduated? 15 years, 16? 
<laughs> anyway, he may have stepped out, but, but, but you know, I, I was, was blessed with coaching high school football for a time at Hernando Christian, and Corey was there, and my son Jeremy was there, and so I got to spend time, and I got to see Brielle play, play AAU volleyball and college volleyball and things like that, and so I, I was part of their lives, but it, it's like a, a blink, and they're grown, and so now with grandchildren, I, I really, and I know Stephanie feels the same way, we, we want to just hug them and grab them and, and spend time with them, you know, because... The kids, the kids are gone, you know. So when, when we see that Jacob favored Joseph because he, he, he was a, a son of his old age, I can, I can really, I can, I, can, I can empathize with him because it may not be right, but I, I understand it because uh, a lot of his sons were much older. And so maybe, maybe Jacob realized that, gee, I, I've missed their growing up. Um, in a previous message, we learned that Joseph's brothers hated him. Uh, Reuben was the oldest, but Joseph got the, the fancy multicolored coat, which is quite a rarity, I think, in this time in, in, uh, for, for the, the Israelites. Um, they, it was just rare to have, have thread of color. Um, their hatred grew and grew, and he tells them about the, the dream he has where the, the, the bundled sheaves of grain are bowing down to him. And then he tells them about uh, how the moon and the stars and even his mother and father are going to be bowing down to him. And, and Jacob even says to Joseph, what dream is this that you have dreamed? And so, you know, he's having these dreams, but he hasn't given any type of an interpretation yet. So Jacob sends Joseph to go check on his brothers who are out tending the, the flocks in the field. And one of the brothers exclaims, here comes the dreamer. Well, Reuben's the oldest brother, and, and so probably they were listening to him. You know, now, Reuben, we know from 3722, actually, his intent was to restore Joseph to Jacob, their father. But the other brothers, saw, they saw him approaching, and they, they devise a plot to kill him. And Reuben talks him out of it, says, throw him in the pit. They see a caravan approaching of Ishmaelites, and... Uh, Judah, another brother, he convinces them to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. So I guess what was bad is a little less bad, but even so, they're taking their own flesh and blood and they're selling him into slavery for, for 20 pieces of silver. Um, then they concoct a story. They take that, that fancy coat and they dip it in goat's blood. And then they take it back to their father Jacob and they tell him, he, he must have been, been killed by a wild animal. And, and so, you know, we, we learn that Jacob, upon hearing this, is obviously distraught, and he refused to be comforted because here maybe his favorite son is, is gone, or at least, in, you know, to his knowledge, he's gone. So Joseph is, is in this caravan, scholars think, for maybe two or three weeks. So he's, I don't know, shackled, tied up, whatever, who knows if he had food and water, but I guess if you buy a slave, you want to take care of him. So anyway, they get to Egypt, and the Ishmaelites sell Joseph to Potiphar, Pharaoh's captain of the guard. And uh, a couple of things I want you to remember that regardless of Joseph or you or me or whatever, God is absolutely sovereign in every affair, in all of our affairs. And, and what Joseph's brothers intended for evil, God uses for good. And I think the same is true in our lives. Sometimes we, we can't see it at the time. It's hard. You know, we're, we're blessed in the trials, but boy, I'll be darned if I can see it sometimes. In Genesis 39, 2 and 3, we see that the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and his master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. So here already we see God is giving wisdom to Potiphar. Eventually, Joseph becomes the, the head of the whole household. So, you know... Potiphar turns over all the affairs of his house to him, and, and, and the Lord made everything that Joseph touched succeed. So Potiphar's not a dummy. He, he, he saw the benefit in, in having this Hebrew uh, take care of his house. If you missed last week's sermon, Pastor Gunn mentioned that while in the jail, the captain of the guard put Joseph in charge. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed there as well. And the Lord was with Joseph. And, and there's, there's a, something I never forget. If God is with you, who can be against you? Yep. So later on, Joseph gets the interpretation from God of the baker and the cupbearer's dreams. And, and Joseph says to them, 
do not interpretations belong to God? So, so basically he's self-deprecating. He's saying, God can interpret this, but I can't. Uh, Joseph asks them to remember his plight when they're released, but the cupbearer forgets Joseph after he returns to work in Pharaoh's house. And this brings us to today's uh, text for, for Genesis. It's chapter 41, and it's verses 1 through 41. And now this is a, a long text, and, and I hope you'll, you'll pardon me if I don't read every single verse, but I, I will do my best to, to speak to them all. And, and I, I'd like to remind you that, that this scripture, it's infallible, it's inerrant, and it's inspired. And it's also our only infallible rule of faith and practice. So child rearing, if you get into Levitical law about how to treat your food, all the other things, it, it's all right here. It's all we need. Um, after, uh, verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 8 here real quick. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. Now, Lily, do you have a picture for us of a plump cow, maybe? I don't know if you can see this, girl, but, but I, I, I was raised around cattle. So if my grandfather were alive, he would say that this cow is mud fat because she's sleek, she's slick. You can't see her hips, you can't see her ribs, but she's a good-looking girl, very healthy. And behold, there came up out of the Nile uh, seven other cows, ugly and thin, uh, after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. So, Lily, have we got a, a, a sick, ugly, oh, this cow, she's, she's rank, she's bad, the poor girl has been malnourished, you know, and uh, you can see her hips and all of her ribs and, and just uh, hasn't been treated so well. So we have to imagine that we've got seven fat, plump cows and seven really poor, ugly cows. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows and Pharaoh awoke and he fell asleep again and dreamed a second time and behold seven ears of grain plump and good were growing on one stalk and so maybe this you know I've never I guess I've grown a little bit of corn in the garden but you can see all the kernels are plump and full and so there's one stalk with seven ears on it and behold after them sprouted seven ears thin and blighted by the east wind so these were ugly. Uh, this one, as you can see, all these kernels are what they call dented. So this wouldn't be very good to eat. But, but nevertheless, uh, the thin, and, and verse 7, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and all his wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh had had not one, but two strange dreams that left him very troubled. Um, and not one of his demonic arts magicians or wise men can explain what his dreams actually mean. Now, now these guys are the Egyptian precursors to a similar group of uh, dark magicians, uh, hundreds of years later, almost 500 years later, that are able to mimic a couple of signs that God performs through Moses while he's petitioning Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, if you remember. And in, in Deuteronomy 13, Moses uh, mentions that uh, he tells the, the readers that they are part of an ancient pagan religion. And, and just, a, just a, maybe a caution. Now, if you are somebody who believes in, in palm readers or psychics or tarot cards or all this other stuff, don't think that you're playing with anything other than demonic forces. I just... You know, I remember my mother, when we were children, she freaked out when we wanted to get a Ouija board. We didn't know what it was. Our friends had them. But I mean, I, I, just, I, I just caution you because, you know, uh, the scripture says that Satan prowls around looking for someone to devour, and it might just be one of these little silly things where, where you get pulled into something you shouldn't be. Um, so these guys, these, these magicians had quite a few tricks up their sleeve, but they still could not interpret Pharaoh's dreams, quite frankly, because they didn't know the Lord. And, and their little tricks couldn't do it. So, so let's move on now to, to verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us 
giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Joseph explains that the dreams are interpreted by God and not by himself. And I think Joseph, in doing that, honors God by giving God the credit and glory. And, and importantly for Joseph, I think it's, uh, it's moderating his psyche. He, he doesn't take credit, and he, he, or, or th he doesn't think he has any part in it other than just to be a mouthpiece, just to communicate the meaning of the dreams. Now, we know from Genesis 37 that, that Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. You know, probably mature physically, but I would say from my own experience, not mentally yet, but, but he's, a, he's a, a strapping young man. Now, he spent two years in Potiphar's house, having been sold to him as a slave, uh, before being delivered to the captain of the guard and imprisoned. And, and Pastor Greg mentioned this in a sermon last week, and, and I, I was reading a book uh, by John MacArthur on Genesis 34 through 50, and he mentions the same thing, that this captain of the guard could very well have been Potiphar, because he knew uh, he's seen Joseph manage his household, and everything was proper, and God blessed everything. And so whomever the captain of the guard was, if it was Potiphar or not, uh, they put Joseph in charge. Now, the baker and the cupbearer, these two men, they have direct access to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And so it's a, I guess, a, a, I've never really been so important that I had to have somebody taste my drink before I drank it, but that was the butler, the cupbearer's function, was to make sure an enemy wasn't trying to poison, uh, poison the king. So for whatever they had done, we don't know, but, but they sent, he sends the, the cupbearer and the baker to prison, and anyway, they're high and mighty. They're, they're officials in, in the cabinet of Pharaoh, if you will. So uh, needless to say, the captain of the guard needs to take good care of him compared to the other prisoners, which I'm sure... In those days, boy, I couldn't imagine being, being in prison. But nevertheless, Joseph, so Joseph is put in charge of, of the baker and the cupbearer. And Pastor Greg, you know, he, he mentioned how last week they, you know, Joseph even notices he, when they, they wake up the morning after their dreams and he's like, well, why are you troubled? Your, your faces are downtrodden, you know. So, so Joseph was, was um, he was a good caretaker. He was looking out for, for his prisoners. Now, when Joseph was younger, his dreams got him into trouble. You remember I mentioned the sheaves, they're, they're bowing. Um, you know, and, and he's talking about the sun and the moon and the stars and mom and dad will bow down to me. Well, Joseph was young and immature. And while his dreams gave him a glimpse of the future, he hadn't been blessed with the interpretation of these dreams by God yet. And, and I have to wonder if Joseph's faith, which I have to believe his faith was strong, probably from birth he was, was brought up, loving the Lord and, and, and fearing the Lord. Um, but I have to wonder if, if maybe as he, as he thinks back through, through this time, you know, he's, I'm sure God encouraged him and I'm sure God lifted him up because we don't see anything otherwise. But I have to wonder if Joseph wasn't thinking back to those dreams and what do they mean? Uh, what's God gonna do in my life? But I'll tell you, having never been there by the grace of God, I, I have to believe that 11 years or so in prison would be a dramatically humbling experience to anybody. I mean, uh, you're, you don't have control over what you do through any course of any day. Somebody pretty much owns you. But, but God used this time, I feel, along, along the time he was in Potiphar's house, but God used this time to hone Joseph's management skills, if you will, for a modern term. You know, um, God blessed what he did, managed the household just fine, managed the prisoners just fine, took care of the two important, the cup, baker and the, uh, cup bearer and the baker. And so, so God is, God's working on him, but he's keeping him humble at the same time. But he didn't let him get so discouraged in all the disappointment, as, as Pastor Greg mentioned last week. Joseph, you know, is, is still Johnny on the spot when needed. Now, have you ever had a dream and, and you wake up and you're, it's like, wow, I'm glad that was a dream. Because Wednesday night, I, uh, what do I carry? One of these little ridge things. So this is, this is my wallet anymore. The kids got me that a couple years ago, which I really like it. And here's my phone. Now, my, my workstation for UBS uses facial recognition. So I dreamed, and I can't work if I don't have my phone. So I dreamed that I lost my phone and my wallet. And I'm just like, and I'm, you know, you think about all the hassle. I've got, you got to go get a new phone. And I don't have the SIM card. And I got 5,000 contacts in there. And plus all my work 
apps and all the other apps. It's what a hassle. And then trying to get a driver's license now is like, like an act of Congress. I mean, you got to take your birth certificate. You know, it's like, what? When we moved, I had to, uh, Stephanie, do I have a birth certificate? And sure enough, she had it in the little firebox, you know? So, uh, but anyway, I was relieved when I woke up from that dream because I'm just thinking, oh, well, I got to do all this mess. And, and so anyway, I was really, really glad to realize it was a dream. Now, now, once again, I want to give you some things to commit to memory. I don't have any slides on these, but God is absolutely sovereign in all things and at all times. But, but So everything, all the details that have been happening here from the actions of Joseph's brothers to the Ishmaelites who buy him to Potiphar buying him to him being thrown in jail, that is all orchestrated. God is sovereign in all that. God alone gives true wisdom, and he's, he's imparting it to Joseph. Joseph's life is wisdom displayed, but, but we must humble ourselves to find true wisdom because if we, if we try to go before the God of the universe haughty and proud, guess what? You're, you're not going to get what you seek because as we're learning in, in Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis right now, in his opinion, pride is, is probably the greatest sin, and I have to think that humbling ourselves is about the only way to get this wisdom from God. Now we move on to Joseph being recalled from prison and brought into the presence of Pharaoh. This was an urgent summons, but not before Joseph is shaved. Um, and, and, and they gave him a change of clothes. The Egyptians thought that facial hair was filthy. Now, now let me repeat that. The, the, the Egyptians thought that facial hair was filthy. I don't, I'm not calling anybody out in this room or anything. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, I, I've read that they actually would shave their whole body. So uh, anyway, so Joseph is, is shaven and he's, he's put in clean clothes and he's brought before Pharaoh. So let's jump to, to verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. Now think about th th this mention here I think is ironic because this is the second time he was put in a pit. Remember the brothers put him in a pit. So uh, a lot of the prisons were dug, so much more difficult to escape. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now, once again, Joseph sidesteps all the credit and he gives the, the honor to God. But the thing here, and I couldn't find any, any commentary on this verse, which, you know, it is or whatever, you know. But, but for him to say, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now, he didn't give the baker a favorable answer. He got hanged. But, but here, I think, now, I don't know, but, but is, is God giving Joseph the insight that, that the dream that Pharaoh had, God's going to give him a favorable answer? I, I, I don't know, but I just, I wonder that. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so I, I will not repeat the description of the cows because I think we got that, seven fat and seven lean. Uh, but let's move on to, to verse 20. And so this is Pharaoh recanting his dream to Joseph. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk full and good. Seven ears withered, thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted up after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of the Pharaoh are one. God revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that it is fixed by God. And God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during these seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities. And let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine 
that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. And, and we know that all this, in the known world there, uh, this was a severe drought, a severe famine came about. And, and so did God cause it? We're not told that, but God knew it was coming. So he's, he's once again totally sovereign, putting all these events in place. Now, none of the magicians could interpret the dreams, but God gave Joseph their exact meaning. Not only does God impart the events that are coming, he, he gives Joseph the insight to tell Pharaoh how to prepare for this pending disaster but by taxing the overabundance of these seven plentiful years by 20% and storing it and holding it in storage to be eaten in the seven years of famine. And, and if you have to think about I was a produce broker for 18 years, and I, there would be times where I'd have, I don't know, three or four rail cars, which are 2,400 50-pound boxes of un, uh, either bags of onions or, or Idaho potatoes on rail cars. And then they'd come to Tampa and they'd get unloaded. And I'd have those working, and I'd have trucks coming with all sorts of produce, apples, oranges, peaches, plums, nectarines, all the stuff that, that you can imagine. And, and it would be sometimes a logistical nightmare. And so I have to, have to feel for, for what poor Joseph's going to face in the future is trying to orchestrate all these Egyptian farmers to harvest all this grain and to store all this grain. It was a monumental effort. Um, well, verse 41, 37, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Now, wait a second. What, stop. What's happened here? These Egyptians, they worship Ra, the, the god of the sun. Has Pharaoh just had a crisis of belief? I, I think so. Has, has Pharaoh been granted wisdom by the Almighty God? And it, it would seem so. So Pharaoh, like it or not, and, and I think there were 67 Pharaohs. He was earlier on. The one around Moses, God used them both, and, and probably others in between. Um, Verse 39 says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh's admission to me is extremely powerful. Um, Pharaoh says, Since God has shown you all this, he doesn't say, your God, he doesn't say that your Hebrew God, that guy, he refers to him as God. So I don't know what the future of Pharaoh was, but he, he sure was, was, uh, he was honoring God here in his speech and his action. To me, Pharaoh's admission is very important because this lowly slave, Hebrew prisoner, low-class foreigner, through him, the God of the universe, gives wisdom to Pharaoh, and as a result, gives control over the whole country of Egypt to this lowly Joseph guy. You know, this reminds me of, of what Mordecai tells Esther, where, where Joseph is, because, you know, he, Mordecai sends message, a message to her. He's in prison at the time, and he says, and who knows whether you have come not to, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So I, I have to believe that, that Joseph was placed by God in the perfect place at the perfect time in history to be his oracle so that God could show him his glory and all that he was going to do and, and all those around him, to Potiphar, to, to Pharaoh, to all the, the, all the officials that, that saw what had happened. Uh, you know, this saves countless people from starvation. Uh, and, and the fact that, that God placed him for such a time as this, I think, is, is pretty cool. Um, another quote from John MacArthur's book, uh, Joseph had made himself available to God, accepting the circumstances the Lord brought into his life, and as a result, even Pharaoh could discern that the Spirit of the Lord was working in him. God is absolutely sovereign in all things, in all affairs, and at all times. Joseph's life history is wisdom lived out. Because, you know, we have to think that there's many scriptures. I got enough here. I could probably go till about two o'clock, but I don't know if you got plans or not. But wi wisdom is better than weapons of war, from Ecclesiastes nine, First Corinthians. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the debtor of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? There are there are not countless, but there are an awful lot of uh, scriptures that talk about wisdom and knowledge, and 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 you know, true knowledge only comes from God. Um, Let's, let's consider some points here as I, I try to 
open the landing gear and land this plane, if you will. Potiphar saw that Joseph was blessed by God and gave him authority, and God made all that he did succeed. The captain of the guard saw the blessings of God and put Joseph in charge of the prisoners. The baker and the cupbearers saw the wisdom of God through Joseph uh, accurately interpreting their dreams. Uh, and by interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, God imparted wisdom to Pharaoh and induced him to place Joseph in a position of authority over all Egypt so that countless could be saved from the coming famine. God humbled Joseph through slavery and prison, but Joseph never ever became jaded or distraught. Through it all, God gave Joseph wisdom to manage a, a giant undertaking to eventually store and distribute all this crop um, that was beyond measure. Also, consider that Joseph, once he was in command of all of Egypt, he didn't become conceited because of his position. I, I contemplated this this week. What would I have done? Because if you think about it, if I'm number two, and I can do whatever I want. I'm sure Joseph could have probably put somebody in prison or maybe put him to death. And if, if, you, know, if you were a, a, revengeful, a vengeful person and, and wanted revenge, you know, think about Potiphar's wife. She lied. You know, she, she accuses him of rape and, and has him put in prison. Potiphar, you know, having gone along with his wife and having kept him in prison for what we think... Joseph was probably about 30 years old when he went before Potiphar, so he's probably in jail, in prison, about 11 years, all totaled. Um, and, and, and the cupbearer, you know, not that that was such an egregious thing, but, oh, I forgot, I'm sorry, you spent another two years in prison. Um, Joseph didn't feel a need to get even because God was with him, and God caused him to, to succeed, everything he touched. And I have to believe by this time that Joseph knew that God was with him, and that God had blessed him, because Look at all the, the trials he had been through. So, you know, um, I don't always take notes in sermons, but when I do, last week I took notes because I felt like Pastor Greg's points were so very uh, strong, and, and I think we should remember these from last week. Through, through depths of disappointment, we must remember God still guards. Through depths of disappointment, we must remember we should serve others anyway. Joseph was a willing servant, you know, did an awful lot of things despite his, his imprisonment and, and uh, being a slave. Through depths of disappointment, we must remember, point others to the Lord. You know, even in, in the depths of, and I think that's where people see our faith is, is when we're really under trials. That, I think that's when, when our faith shows the most and our witness does. Uh, so, and don't give up on what God has for you. He, he has a greater plan for us than we can ever ask or imagine would be my, my testament to you. Don't, don't give up on what God has for you. And always remember that you were not forgotten. Joseph didn't forget. He, he knew it. So as I close here, um, where are you today? I don't know all of you. I, I wish I did. We've grown a little bit. Um, where's, where's your faith? Where's your heart? You know, because um, in John, Jesus said, you know, no man comes to me, uh, well, no one comes to me, uh, no one comes to the Father except by me. And so we can't save ourselves. We, we can't, no matter how smart, no matter how many degrees, PhDs, I think that probably gives you a tougher time being saved, honestly, because you think you know it all. But, but you know, we, we can't save ourselves. Jesus made that perfect substitutionary sacrifice on that cross. He was sinless, he was perfect. We aren't, but he was and he did that in our stead. And so that God will look on us as sinless when, when we're called before him one day. And so, you know, if you, if you don't know Christ as your personal savior and you wanna learn more, uh, talk with us. We'd, we'd love to pray with you about it.